Welcome to Grace Abounds. I'm Pastor Jen Shaw, and in this podcast, I'm sharing my Sunday sermons from St. John's Lutheran Church, Palm Desert, California. I'm so grateful that you've joined us, and I trust that these words build you up in faith, hope, and love. I was the communications manager at Universal Studios Hollywood Theme Park when I began attending Ascension Lutheran Church in Thousand Oaks. And after I joined the church, I began attending a small group Bible study that met in the church library every Tuesday night. And as we studied and prayed and shared our lives together, they became dear friends. After I became a member of our small group, we studied the book of Genesis, which includes the story of Joseph. Joseph, whose mother Rachel died when he was young, was the favorite son of the 12 sons of his father Jacob. When Joseph was 17 years old, his father gave him a coat of many colors And Joseph shared dreams with his family that he would one day rule over them. This so angered his jealous older brothers that they wanted to kill him. When the eldest brother, Reuben, talked them out of this, the others threw Joseph in a well, sold him into slavery, and told their father that Joseph was dead. Now pause for a moment to consider. We may know how the story ends, But Joseph didn't. What did he feel as he sat in the bottom of that well, wondering what his own brothers were going to do next? Joseph was taken to Egypt, where he became the slave of Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh. The Lord was with Joseph, and he rose to manage the entire household until Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of trying to attack her, and he was thrown in jail. The Lord was with Joseph, and he rose to manage the entire jail. He was there unjustly imprisoned for years. What were those years like for him? And then the Pharaoh had a dream that no one could interpret until until Joseph was brought to the Pharaoh And he interpreted what the Pharaoh's dream meant. Seven years of abundance would be followed by seven years of famine. The Lord was with Joseph, and Joseph rose to manage the entire national program to collect and store food in preparation for the famine. He became second in command to the Pharaoh. Did the challenges of the past prepare him? for the challenges of the future. Sometime later, because of the famine, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt to buy food. So many years had passed that they didn't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized them. And after much back and forth, Joseph revealed who he was to them, and he was reunited with his family, including his father, Jacob. The Lord was with Joseph through it all. God was faithful to Joseph, and Joseph was faithful to God. He trusted in the Lord and did what was right, even when others sinned against him and caused him harm, even in the most difficult circumstances, even in the midst of great uncertainty, he didn't give up. Joseph kept making the best of the situation. And by the grace and power of God, he rose above his circumstances. Our small group at Ascension was studying Joseph's story when I was laid off from my job as communications manager at Universal Studios Hollywood. And at the time, it was hurtful and stressful and caused a great deal of uncertainty in my life. But as I was sitting at that table in the church library, surrounded by my friends, I realized that Joseph was not defined by his circumstances. 
The Lord was with him through it all, and he remained a person of integrity and compassion and faith through all the ups and downs. I realize that like Joseph, I am not defined by my circumstances. I am defined by my relationship with the Lord who made me and has saved me and loves me forever. And I am called to rise above my circumstances. The Lord is with me as the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with you even when others sin against you and cause you harm, even in the most difficult circumstances, even in the midst of great uncertainty, you are not alone. And you are not defined by your circumstances. You are defined by your relationship with the Lord who made you and has saved you and loves you forever, who will see you through who will work all things together for good. As Joseph tells his brothers in our reading for today, after their father Jacob dies, Joseph's brothers, understandably, are afraid that Joseph, now in a position of power over them, will seek revenge for all they did to him. But he doesn't. Joseph calms their fears. He speaks kindly to them. He tells his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God meant it for good, to keep a great many people alive, people who were being fed in the midst of a famine. And not only that, then Joseph tells his brothers that he personally will provide for them and their families. Joseph demonstrates the forgiveness to which Jesus calls his followers in our gospel reading from Matthew 18. Just prior to this, Jesus has instructed his disciples to seek reconciliation when a member of the church sins against them, to go to that person and have a conversation to try to work things out, to offer opportunities for the damaged relationship to be repaired. In our reading for today, the disciple Peter asked Jesus a follow-up question. How many opportunities do I have to offer? How many conversations do I have to have? How often should I forgive? As many as seven times, which seems pretty generous in human terms. If you think about it, someone wrongs you and you forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. forgive. But Jesus says, no, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times or as some translations have it, 70 times 7. The point is not the exact number. In Hebrew thought, 7 represents fullness, completeness, abundance. 7 times 7 or 77 represents whatever number it takes, an unlimited amount. There is no end to forgiveness. Now, I know it may seem that the parable Jesus tells immediately after this response to Peter seems to contradict what Jesus just said. I could tell by some of the reactions when I read the ending of that parable. Given that the king does not forgive the slave for not forgiving a fellow slave. But I suggest that this is Jesus employing what Martin Luther would call the second use of the law. The first use of the law, the civil use, are the rules that maintain order in a fallen society. The second use of the law, the spiritual use, convicts us of our sin and reminds us of our need for grace. 
The law shows us that we can't keep the law. The law, as this parable does, reminds us that unfailing love really is the Lord's standard for how we are to live our lives every day in relationship with one another, and that we often and tragically fail. We fall short of the glory of God. We do not forgive as we have been forgiven. We do not share the grace we have received. We act in ungrateful, selfish, damaging ways. And knowing this about us, our Lord knows in this life, we need to hear the law. We need to be challenged. We need to be motivated to do the right thing. The law is good, but it is insufficient. The law reminds us we need a savior, but the law doesn't save us. This parable is part of the story, but it's not how the story ends. We are not under the law. We are under grace. Mercy endures forever. The Lord God would not call on us to be endlessly forgiving if he were not endlessly forgiving himself. The whole testimony of Scripture is that the Lord is gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love. As shepherd, king, and poet David writes in Psalm 103, as far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is our Lord's steadfast love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far does the Lord remove our transgressions from us. God does not deal with us according to our sins. God deals with us according to God's love. And we know God's love in Jesus Christ, the God of all creation in the flesh, who loves us so much that he joined with us in our humanity, lived a life of grace and truth, forgave sinners, suffered along with us, died on the cross and forgave our sins, took our death as his own and freed us from it forever, rose again to life and gives us life eternal. He is with us and for us now and forever. And one day, we will join him and all the saints in glory. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 14, we do not live to ourselves and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Paul offers these words of encouragement as he is reminding his fellow Christians, reminding us that we all belong to the Lord who made us and has saved us and loves us forever. He is the one to whom we are accountable. He is the merciful judge. And so, Paul asks, why do you judge each other over differences of view? Why do you have contempt for each other? Why do you gather together as the community of faith and then argue over opinions in damaging ways? Rather, Paul says, do what you do from personal conviction with integrity and with goodwill understanding for those who in good faith see things differently than you do. And whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God and for the good of this world God so loves. And Paul writes in Romans 12, if someone does offend you, wrong you, sin against you, don't seek revenge. Follow the example of Joseph. Seek forgiveness. In the words of Franciscan theologian Richard Rohr, forgiveness reveals three goodnesses simultaneously. When we forgive, we choose the goodness of the other over their faults. 
we experience God's goodness flowing through ourselves, and we experience our own capacity for goodness in a way that almost surprises us. We are finally in touch with a much higher power, and we slowly learn how to draw upon this infinite source. To forgive someone is not to ignore the harm that they have caused or allow it to continue. To forgive someone is to acknowledge that they have caused harm and to offer them the opportunity to change. To forgive is to stop holding a grudge, to let go of our own anger and resentment, to free ourselves from those negative emotions that don't do us or anybody else any good. To forgive is to allow the person we forgive to grow and change and be different than they were before. Forgiveness opens the opportunity for relationships to heal and deepen and reflect the grace of God. When we forgive others, we do for them what God in Christ has done for us. Where is there a need for forgiveness in your life today? May we forgive as we have been forgiven. May we love as we are loved. May the goodness of God flow through us. Amen. Thanks for listening. Each week's episode is edited by Nick Cox. Music performed by our St. John's Worship Band. Sermons by me, Pastor Jen Shaw. Make sure to subscribe to hear each week's message. If you'd like to know more about St. John's mission to know Christ and make Christ known, to share the life-giving word and do the life-giving work of Jesus, visit our website, stjohnslutheran.church. May God bless you on this day and in all the days ahead.